um, first of all, I want to start by welcoming everybody for tuning in, and I want to absolutely um, uh, thank also Federico for uh, agreeing to give a keynote for us, um, with us, um, outlining the fabulous career that you have had um, as an entrepreneur. And I think examining the career paths of entrepreneurs and you know the, the pros and cons of it and how you know how you found it a fulfilling career is going to be just what we want everybody to be thinking about um and i'm um, just to, to spare you to spare you some 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 blushes i'll talk a little bit about uh what you've been doing for the last uh, you know for the, the last 20 20 years um but again what we're going to want you to talk about is your your journey um into doing what you have done so um, you are the founder of the world's, uh, the world's first lifestyle e-commerce uh, destination long before Facebook, Instagram, and the iPhone. Um, you were listed on the Milan Stock Exchange, uh, the first IPO uh, at the time for 18 months, and you remain a unicorn. Uh, so we can talk about um, you know, what, what exactly that means. Um, you, uh, you were behind the acquisition of Netaporte, uh, which again is a, you know, is, for me, you know, had been a destination that I'd been I'd been using for you know for quite a long time, uh, and uh, and still and you know still love. So you know, understanding that journey. The merger. Yes, uh, uh, sorry, the merger. Sorry, apologies. Mm -hmm. um, and now you are employing five thousand five hundred people on a global basis. You're rated in Italy and in the UK as one of the top employers to to work for. Um, and so, how, you know, what more appropriate thing than starting off our journey of if you're one of the most exciting companies to work for, both in, uh, it, it, you know, sort of in a number of different countries, you know, why is that? And what kind of jobs are you creating? I mean, you've created 5,500, which is pretty cool for any entrepreneur. Um, but what are those jobs like? And for anybody who's in college or secondary school now, what kind of subjects should they be thinking about as they uh, aspire to, to have a, you know, a, a pathway, a career pathway in entrepreneurship, uh, even a tiny bit like yours, if not, uh, if not even perhaps, you know, surpassing the success that you have had. So I'd love you to start us off on when you were 14, 15, you know, what gave you the spark when you, when, you know, when you knew that this would be your pathway or did you have a few other, you know, more conventional, you know, what was your pathway into entrepreneurship and, um, uh, and would you recommend it? Okay, thank you so much for the introduction. Good afternoon to everybody. Um, I'm, I'm talking from my home uh, on the Lake Como, uh, where I've been in uh, smart working for almost nine weeks. So managing the company from here uh, has been a tough time, as you can imagine. Like I've never worked so much in my whole life, even during the startup phase, because I had to deal with the safety of uh, all of our people, all of our customers, working on the community, uh, making sure that everything was, uh, let's say, under control. So it was like a really tough time. And now I see the light at the end of the tunnel. So thank you so much. I'm very honored to be here to speak with the students. It's something that I love to speak with the students, to try to transmit some uh, uh, motivation uh, uh, and some entrepreneurialism, uh, which is uh, my driver. Uh, it's always been my driver. So I've, I've been born, I was born in, uh, in, a sm in a small city on the northeast by the sea uh, of Italy called Ravenna, which is famous for its mosaic. And um, I'm coming from, uh, let's say, a very normal family, like my, my mom was working in a kind of a telecom company. Uh, my father was working in the warehouse of Fiat, which is the automotive company. And, um, and I always had uh, this drive to do something by myself. I always wanted to start my own company, my own project. Uh, uh, so I always had the desire. I, I, I remember um, probably even when I was nine or ten uh, that I was selling comics books uh, on, at the beach uh, because, <laughs> because <laughs> I'm probably a merchant as my DNA is the one of the merchant. Merchant uh, yeah. in terms of uh, what uh, I love the customers. I always think about the customers. And, um, and my, my, let's say, my passion for the customer um, has evolved during these years uh, because uh, then uh, 
I saw in '99. Uh, uh, before before that, so before I invented Ux, uh, I I tried to basically to uh, become a good entrepreneur. So someone uh, with a strong background, someone uh, with a solid um, with solid skills. And so um, I went uh, first of all. I went from Ravenna. I went straight to Milan. That uh, you know, for uh, coming from the little province was a big jump. Uh, leaving the family at 19 and um, I went to study economics in a very good school uh, which is called Bocconi. I graduated ma uh, magna cum laude so in four years and then uh, at that point uh, I knew that I wanted to to become an entrepreneur but I didn't have uh, the, the idea because in the end uh, you need the idea to become an entrepreneur you need also something else so waiting for the idea i decided to uh, get stronger and stronger and and so i decided what is the best uh, probably place where i can learn as much as possible in the short time as, in the shorter time as possible and so i went to mergers and acquisitions that uh, it was a it was a, an invest an american investment bank uh, very famous at the time and very famous also later i'm talking about 90 1993 and it was Lehman Brothers uh -huh. <laughs> and and yeah it was I mean at that time it was like one of the best banks and so I went to working in uh, New York uh, the training in New York and then London and then Milan and I personally didn't like finance so it was not my passion but I knew that in three years I, I would got I would have got uh, a strong methodology a strong work ethics uh, and and learn from Excel files uh, to how to manage an IPO, how to do a merger, and so on. And um, and in fact, it proved to be a great school for me. Uh, after three years, though, I decided that it was enough because I mean, like, also because um, the intensity of work there was really amazing. I, I worked ninety hours per week for three years. So it was like uh, it was it was definitely a, a great school, but very intense. So yeah. after three years, I decided it was time to move on, and to at least find the time to come up with this idea because uh, I felt already strong enough after this experience, after the university, after this experience, and so I decided that I wanted to take some time off, but at the same time pretending that I was doing something, and yeah. I thought that the best thing to match these two desires was to take an MBA. And, um, and uh, I went to, I applied to a few schools. Um, some of them, uh, they, didn't, they didn't take me, like Stanford. Uh, some others, they, they, they said yes. Uh, one was uh, in SEAD and one was uh, Columbia University in New York for my MBA. And between uh, the French countryside or New York City, I definitely decided to go for New York City, where I, <laughs> where I knew that I could learn not only from the school, but also from the city, the life there. And like, so from Ravenna to Milan, from Milan to New York. And after like a couple of years in London with Lehman Brothers. And it was a great time at the school. Uh, I didn't compete with the others to get the best job because also already at the time I was uh, thinking that my career was to become an entrepreneur. So like I didn't get into the competition uh, with others to get to the best place at Goldman or at McKinsey. Yeah. Because I knew that I didn't want to go back to Goldman or McKinsey, but I wanted to do something else. And so I really enjoyed the time and I really enjoyed um, experiencing uh, New York, the retail, uh, and it was also the time of the internet. Uh, yeah. Basically, like um, the internet has been uh, invented um, in uh, early 90s. Uh, Amazon, I think, started in 95 or something like that, uh, and it was uh, 98. So, like, it was really the beginning of the internet, a couple of years later. And, and then, uh, finally, uh, when I was in New York uh, with, uh, like, a little bit of lightness, and not like uh, immersed in my full-time job at Lehman, I started uh, thinking about how to match 
uh, the let's say the revolution of the internet also in terms uh, of um, access to capital because uh, as i told you i'm not coming from a rich family so i needed to to find money somewhere and uh, let's say the, the the beauty the power of the internet uh, that i already saw uh, in 98 when i was in new york together with uh, a competitive competitive advantage of being Italian, because at a certain point you need to realize uh, what are your roots and what are your competitive advantage. So Italy is famous for um, the, 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 the three Fs, which is uh, fashion, food and furniture. And uh, I, I certainly picked fashion because it was, a, uh, it was a kind of a passion. The passion, since I was a teenager, was not uh, to let's say to to wear trendy clothes, but it was more like to differentiate myself from my friends. So I was spotting that particular pair of shoes that um, I think I thought that they were particularly cool, and uh, nobody was wearing them. And then uh, two years later, I found out that it was like a big boom. It was the Timberland. I'm talking. I was 12, or the Montclair down jacket. I I took it from my brother that is older than me. And he was using it uh, to go skiing because uh, Montclair down jacket was for skiing. But I, I started to using it during like going to school, going going with my friends uh, during my when I was a teenager. And then after a while, uh, it became a Montclair uh, the, the way you 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 know also now. And so I always I was been interested in uh, retail, this kind of fashion as a differentiation. And uh, so I thought, okay, so internet and fashion. I think that the two worlds, uh, they need uh, an interpreter. They need uh, a trade union, a link, because they are not talking to each other, because they are completely different from each other. And, um, and the fashion world was looking at the internet uh, with, a very, with a lot of skepticism, uh, while the internet world was looking at the fashion uh, like uh, like uh, something that is too glamorous and not techy enough. Well, there were there were many that said that you couldn't turn make the fashion industry go online at the time uh, because well because of uh, they were wrong but clearly um, but they said you know the industries that would go first you know the McKinsey's the industry would go for financial services and some of those others where you're you don't need tangible products and things like that but uh, again and you were the first one that you know put fashion onto the internet and started teasing out that can you make and can you redefine an industry from the way it worked before to being you know much better on online so again it, some would say brave but again really interesting because you paved the way for for hundreds and thousands of e-commerce startups in the fashion you know fashion tech is is a is a you know is a thing, uh, and I yeah, yeah. argue the father yeah, the father yeah. of it in many ways. The New York Times defined me like the man who put fashion on the on the internet, uh, which yeah. I think it is true for many many brands. I convinced many brands to jump and to to launch online for the first time to have their online debut, uh, from uh, Armani to Cucinelli to not only Italian brands, also like French, uh, British, American. Yeah. Yeah, so, um, so how did you, so from the idea, so from knowing uh, almost, you know, well, from the age of nine that you wanted to be an entrepreneur and then discovering that you liked uh, fashion as a way of differentiating you as a person to testing, doing it, you know, testing the financial services and finding out it was distasteful to you to MBA to learn that you had all the, you know, all of the things that you needed to pursue an entrepreneurial mm -hmm. career. Um, what um, what made you do it? What gave you the confidence to to say, right, this is what we're doing? Was it during your MBA? A couple of years after your MBA? Um, what, how did the how how did the because we all some you have lots of ideas, but what made you actually start up a company and persuade customers, that they, brands that they would come on, and then persuade investors that they would would also come on because. If you don't putting your own money in, you had to persuade customers, probably number one, and then um, persuade investors, presumably after you got your customers. So you got your, did you get your customers first and then your investors or some other, some other pathway into actually discovering you're a real live delivering entrepreneur as opposed to an armchair, you know, wannabe entrepreneur? No, the, the beginning, the beginning was fascinating. So first of all, to answer your question, which is a good question, is um, I would say that, um, 
in order to make the final decision that you want to become an entrepreneur, uh, I don't want to make it negative, uh, but uh, I think you need a sort of uh, desperation in the sense that, <laughs> that you, you need not to feel good with what you have because uh, you need to jump uh, in, in a world that you don't know what's going to happen. Yeah. It, it's uncertain. It's full of problems. Uh, it's full of uh, things that you need to fight every day. So what so, happened? What happened after your MBA uh, and before two thousand to make you? Uh, what, you know, what terrible disaster befell you that started off your entrepreneurial? Yeah, no, like, no I, I I always came up with the ideas. Of some some of them they were good. Some of them they were bad. Some of them they were just legends. Some of them they were like crazy or bizarre. Uh, for example, a good one was uh, when I was at university in ninety one. I, it was the beginning of the mobile phone, and uh, I, had, uh, I was among the very first to have a big mobile phone. At that time, the mobile phone was big like that. It was in a... Yeah. In a, a luggable. <laughs> and um, and I've always been fascinated by the communication, the technology, and so I wanted to have it, uh, as a, like to try it and to, and to enjoy it. But at the same time, I realized that it was so big that um, you... I, I tried to invent, uh, to put together with the, such a big phone, also a camera, because, uh, be, because uh, in 91, and because I, I, I imagine that uh, as you teach to your children, and now I have uh, a young daughter that she's uh, eight, almost nine, I always tell her, Margarita, don't run with two hands uh, that they're busy, because if you, if you, fell down, if you fall down, uh, you, you need to have at least one hand that is free. And so how can you have one hand free? So let's put together camera and phone together. And it's funny that now like uh, the phones are becoming more camera almost than phones, which was exactly the idea that I had in 91. But um, what really pushed me to start and to come up with this idea of putting together fashion and the internet was that I went, to, I went back from uh, Colombia, from New York, where I had a fantastic experience uh, one year and a half in New York really changed my life and my perception of the world. Um, I went back to Milan. I accepted a job that I really didn't like. And, uh, and so every morning I was, I was moaning that, first of all, I was back in Milan while I wanted to stay in New York. But uh, in New York, I, I, I applied to, as I said, I didn't apply to Goldman or McKinsey. I, I wanted to be in entertainment. I wanted to work at Disney. I wanted okay. to, you know, to this kind of, uh, of stuff, but I didn't get any job because uh, you, I didn't have any green card. I didn't have any visa. And for an American company, it's, it's, it's quite complicated yeah. to hire an Italian. And so I, I decided to go back to Milan and um, I accepted a job that was quite prestigious for some people, but for me, it was uh, horrible. And every morning I was waking up and say, I'm sad to be back in Milan and I'm sad to go to work. Okay, then it's time to start my own company. And it was uh, October 99. So during, uh, I was working during the day, during the night, I was basically drafting the business plan. In my, in my apartment, in my little apartment in Milan, I was typing the letters yoox.com, available. With the four letters, dot com, in 99, available. I think somebody told me that I had one probability out of two million to find it available as a domain name. Yeah. And, and everything started from there. Then I resigned from that terrible job. It was Christmas 99. And uh, in January, after Christmas, uh, I, I started to look for investors. So the first thing that I had to do was to look for money because I didn't have really any money. Actually, I had uh, a debt because uh, the previous job uh, uh, gave me the scholarship for my MBA. And I had, obviously, when I resigned, I had to pay back all the scholarship plus interest plus taxes, basically double the money that I, I received uh, to go to New York. And... Um, and in a month, only in a month, I found uh, the first investor uh, going through the yellow pages. So it was not through connection or network uh, or yeah. father or mother, because I mean, like, some, uh, as I said, they were not part of this industry. 
and uh, I, I called I called this guy that uh, was supposed to be not only the best but probably also the only venture capitalist in Italy because in Italy venture capitalism is not so well developed like in the Anglo-Saxon world like in London like in Britain uh, yeah. like in America like in the Silicon Valley where you have tons of venture capitalists so I really tried with one and um, he, he said uh, he said basically he said one thing that I remember all the time okay Federico you left your job you have no money you have that it means that either you're uh, too brave or too crazy, or you really believe in this idea. So I, I think that you really believe in this idea and this uh, belief will help you through the different years of struggles and so on. So because of it, it means that you don't have a backup plan. Yeah. And if you don't have a backup plan, I, I, I will back, back you up with my money. And everything started, everything started from there. It was March 2000 when I got the first round of financing. It was 1.5 million euro. At that time, there was the lira, Italian lira. So it was 3 billion lira, 1.5 million euro. So I, I received the first funding on the um, spring equinox. It was the 21st of March 2000. And uh, only three months later, uh, June 21st, uh, 2000, I opened the, the first uh, virtual doors of my first website that it was called uh, Yux.com uh, on the summer solstice. So definitely the seasonality is part of my DNA. And everything started from there. So I went through multiple um, uh, difficulties because it was uh, at that time, I'm sure you remember perfectly well that it was uh, uh, basically in April, May, so after I got the first funding and before I opened the doors, uh, basically there was the birth of the bubble economy. When I, I, I remember that. Um, I do remember that painfully well because um, I floated my company on the 24th of February 2000 on the London and NASDAQ. So uh, again, timing, timing was quite impeccable, but it, it, uh, it sears my brain on a daily basis still remembering um, watching the market collapse. So uh, but you're, you're lucky on your timing. Um, I was like my timing because probably two months later I wouldn't have got any money from anybody. Uh, they they say time, it went down into like nuclear winter for financing uh, right right after that. So again, you're very lucky on your timing, uh, and also that fashion is still something. Fashion and clothing is still something that everybody needs, and you probably took advantage of the crisis um, to change the dynamics of the way the market worked for the incumbents. At the same time, like with the first few 10 people that I've hired, uh, like during that spring 2000, like they were all looking at me and saying like, what's going on? So are we gonna still have a job in one month? And frankly speaking, like um, with them, I always said, no problem, don't worry, everything's gonna be all right, it's a fantastic project. But uh, being alone as an entrepreneur, which is something that maybe I should say to the students that as an entrepreneur, sometimes you, fi you find yourself being alone and making decisions. And like sometimes uh, there's nobody that tells you bravo or, or you did wrong. Or, and so I think it's, it's, it, it's a tough. You need well, a, I'd, love to, I'd love to, and there's a, a few questions sort of piling up, piling up in, the back, in the background. Um, but a couple of things. What were the first... 10 roles that you hired for at Ux once you had the funding. And given in mind that since then you've hired 5,490 other people, um, at least, um, what are the last 10 roles that you may be aware of uh, have been hired for? And I know that you operate in, in and around Hammersmith and White City. Um, and so interested to hear, you know, back then what jobs were they and were they interesting and is it still interesting job that you can have even though there's they, they'd have 5,000 colleagues rather than sort of 10 what's the difference at both ends of the spectrum okay so uh, I have to confess that um, I have uh, I've always uh, been um, uh, a person that uh, puts a lot of trust in young people. So, um, so I didn't start from hiring uh, all top managers, all let's say people that had amazing achievements in the resume, uh, because um, 
it's something that uh, my wife tells me that I'm a bit romantic with that. So I always think that uh, young people, even if uh, they need uh, guidance or guidelines and so on, they always put a lot of passion that goes beyond uh, the skills of, uh, let's say, more mature managers. And they always try to, to um, be surrounded by young people to grow them, to grow them as much as I can. And I have to say that in certain cases, it worked very, very well. In other cases, I got also some delusions, but uh, overall the balance is absolutely positive. So this is to say that I didn't start from hiring the best person from uh, Saint Laurent or the best person from uh, British technology or whatever. I started from very, very um, low ground in the sense that I started to get the office manager, I started to get the, um, the photography, the pack packaging, uh, so all the ABC to get started. And all young people, obviously, they didn't have any skills to do this job because I was inventing it. Were you looking for, were you looking for a mindset, someone with a go-getting attitude more than yeah. a skill and a pre-existing skill set or experience? Yeah. And, and are you, does that still drive your hiring uh, decisions today? And how important is that mindset of, uh, rather than a skill set that's pre-existing? Again, definitely here. the company now is not a startup anymore. So it's a, it's a, it's a big company. I mean, like over 2 billion in sales, uh, 5,500 people. So like uh, it's a different uh, mentality, even if uh, my uh, dream and my drive is always to keep this entrepreneurialism even if we are becoming bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. So like, um, yeah. I, I, for example, I don't like politics. I don't like bureaucracy. I don't like all of these things so that uh, by definition, they are part of a big company. Uh, and so I'm, I'm pushing everybody, HR, the, the different presidents, the different MDs, that they were to also to hire people that, that have a strong drive and the strong determination for growth, uh, for uh, ambition, like, um, and so on. So I think uh, it, it's part of my, let's say, of my, of, of my DNA, you know. And uh, a guy that um, I was very lucky to hire, for example, was a guy that um, he came to the office at the very beginning and he was uh, looking at the um, uh, internet connection, all the, the simple things. But then I found out that he was a, a kind of, um, I mean, there were rumors. I, I, I don't know if it was true or not yet. I didn't ask because I prefer not to know. But the rumors were that he was a very, very strong hacker coming from, uh, coming from um, um, a left-wing place uh, where like, they, they, you know, like they, they do all this hacking stuff. So I asked him, uh, um, Gabriele, why don't you join me as a chief technology officer? And um, he said, I mean, let's talk about it. And then, uh, so this guy, for example, that he was super young and super talented, he was definitely a brain. Um, he stayed with me for, the, for 20 years. He, he, he just left after 20 years because I said, uh, he told me, I mean, in a very good terms, like uh, I did a small party for him and so on. And, um, but he said, Federico, after 20 years, uh, now I'm head of R&D uh, because we hired another CTO like uh, previously. And uh, I, I've enjoyed so much, but after 20 years, it's for me, time to spend time with my family, with my daughters and so on. Yeah. So this was a fantastic experience, for example. So a, a question, um, do you think you've tasted some careers in financial services, others in sort of consulting, um, the career as an entrepreneur? Um, I have felt as an entrepreneur that I learned more as an entrepreneur serving my customers um, every day, perhaps more than I learned every month when I was working in a larger company. Is that, uh, do you feel the same? Is every day give you learning, you know, give you learning and fulfillment. Um, but uh, do you learn more now, even still? I mean, 20, 20 years in, are you still learning? And um, do you think an advice to somebody who's considering working for an entrepreneurial company like yours or who has aspirations for being an entrepreneur, where are they going to learn more? 
So in terms of the customer, I, I'm, 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 I don't know how to say it, but uh, yeah, I would say probably I'm obsessed by the customer, uh, by the customer experience. And uh, it's something that, uh, as I told you, when I was a young kid uh, selling books uh, at the beach uh, in my hometown, I always, I always uh, focus on retail because I always love the customer. And, yeah. uh, and to tell you the truth, I invented Dukes in 99 as the shop of my dreams. So I was customer number one. So I wanted to invent a place where um, customers could mix and match at accessible prices, because at that time I didn't have any money, um, end of season products, but beautiful and long lasting products of quality together with vintage, together with um, big brands, uh, together with uh, home design uh, objects. Uh, so like a, a place that didn't exist. And that because of that's what I wanted. And I have to say that 20 years later, this year is the 20th anniversary. I find Dukes uh, still very contemporary because it's all about sustainability. So it's buy less, buy, buy better. You know, that's more or less what... Uh, um, Prince Charles uh, is uh, telling everybody. So this is to say that customers have always been um, uh, my obsession. Even when I merged with Neta Porte, that is an important part of my career and uh, of my of my group, is uh, probably the most important thing that I've done um, after founding Ux uh, was uh, to merge with Neta Porte. And the reason behind the merge with Neta Porte was because. Uh, I, I thought uh, and I knew and uh, I have to confirm that the customers of Net-a-Porte, they were completely different from the customers of Dukes. And so the two companies together could win together because uh, they didn't have any overlaps in terms yeah. of geographies, in terms of customer base and so on. And um, uh, what uh, I, I would uh, suggest to somebody approaching a company like ours is that, uh, I mean, innovation and um, yeah, I would say innovation and coming up with new ideas is something that is not only in the technology team. Out of 5,500 uh, people, the biggest team is technology for us, which means that data, data scientist, um, artificial intelligence uh, specialist, uh, visual recognition, computer vision, uh, uh, I mean, all the big data, data insights, customer data. So all, all of this uh, is part of our, let's say, bread and butter in terms of technology. But innovation is uh, something that uh, everybody at Uxneta Porte is thinking innovatively every day. So during the coronavirus, what can we invent uh, in the warehouse in order to protect our people, in order to make sure that um, there's safety first, at the same time, uh, we have also business continuity. And uh, so, and first thing that we did it was uh, coming up with an innovation. Uh, what can we do in order to um, expand in uh, China? And this was another innovation and, and so on. So like, uh, so innovation is part of our DNA. So if yeah. I think- so if you're that, a curious, if you've got that curiosity and the growth mindset, then working in an entrepreneurial company that's been on a journey like yours is going to be absolutely fascinating. Mm -hmm. Rather than some of the TV shows that show you working for companies is, you know, is a drudge. Whereas, you know, I, I absolutely think that in entrepreneurial companies, it's the most attractive place for anybody to work um, because mm -hmm. that sense of wonderment and we can solve any problem that's thrown at us is you know, is, is just that. It's like, yeah, a problem is an opportunity to, uh, you know, to, to, to make the world a better place. I wanted to touch on, there's a whole pile of questions, but I also wanted to touch on the fabulous opportunity that you have given some students in Ayrshire uh, with your, you know, so Scotland, uh, with, with designing products for you and working with students in Milano at the same time. And I understand that the launch is this fall, um, or autumn, I would say for our transatlantic uh, audience. <laughs> um, but tell me, what, what put that idea in your head? And I love it because it's collaboration across countries. It's handing incredible responsibility to young students. Um, and it's saying, okay, 
team A in Scotland, you're manufacturing this idea that team, you know, team B in Milano came up with. That's not simple. So what gave you the idea? Um, and, you know, you know, when we go to purchase the high end products in the autumn, uh, I guess I know where, where we find them. Um, but uh, just tell us how, what, what gave you that idea? Because I think it's a gorgeous idea for and a great lesson to um, international collaboration, to learning by doing, uh, and also to turning to young people to create opportunities rather than you know thinking it's for some somebody in a corner somewhere in you know you know in in some you know in a, in a design room. It's for young kids to create the clothes that they want to wear from sustainable products. So I'd love to hear a, a little bit more about that, and then we're going to get to a rapid fire through the questions that have built up, so we can. Uh, make sure that we don't have a very grumpy audience for having answered all the really okay. great questions. So, brief, briefly, I mean, uh, first of all, um, I, I consider myself someone, I mean, okay, like I did the IPO, uh, the merger, and then uh, the acquisition by Richmond. So, like, uh, definitely, I've been involved uh, in uh, many financial transactions. But if you ask me what is your best quality, I would say coming up with ideas. So like uh, I, I consider myself someone that is uh, throwing ideas all the time. Not everything is good, as I said, but um, that's what I like the most, at least in terms of my job. Yeah. And, and I find so uh, fulfilling to see the ideas then coming true through the execution of my teams, which is probably the best thing that you can, uh, you can, uh, you can feel, no? like from an idea to to a, rea a reality, I think it's something that for an entrepreneur is the best thing that you can have. So in the case of Prince Charles and the Modern Artisan Project, that's the one that you referred to, um, I simply connected the dots in a way that uh, as a tech entrepreneur, I always believed in a world without borders uh, because for technology, for the internet, uh, the borders do not exist in a way, no, because our technology is uh, global, it's worldwide. And, um, and even Leonardo da Vinci was talking about, uh, you know, 500 years ago, was talking about the internet when he was saying that, uh, in, he was saying in, in one of his books, in the At Atlanticus Code, he was saying that um, one day people will talk um, among each other and they will hug each other, even if they are at the completely opposite hemisphere of the world. And so, so first of all, uh, the fact that I believe in a border-free world and uh, I, I would love my daughter to travel to UK without uh, showing the passport uh, and as well as uh, I don't like the populist in Italy and so on. So this is more like the, the, the driver. Then sustainability, because I've been focused on sustainability, definitely when uh, at least no one in my industry, the fashion industry, was uh, even uh, thinking of it because I started uh, this sustainability path in 2009, which is 11 years ago, with the launch of Uxygen. And it was a big project uh, around my company. So not only like um, uh, stocking uh, sustainable fashion, but also like hybrid cars, uh, sustainable packaging, uh, recycled paper, so everything around the company became sustainable in 2009. So, can okay, imagine now? And so, I think we are at the forefront of innovation for sustainability. And then uh, I, 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 I met Prince Charles because he came to visit our tech hub in London. He was very kind to come and visit us. Um, uh, we were one of the few companies that were investing heavily in London despite Brexit. And um, he, he came to visit us and uh, we connected. For, for a reason, we connected, uh, probably because uh, we, we, we spoke about a common friend that was a Sicilian Marquise that uh, just passed away. And so we connected in a way, invited me also to go to Scotland. And once in Scotland, I saw the amazing work that he's doing at Dumfries House, like uh, giving jobs to all these young people. So again, young people is something that we have in common. And, uh, and uh, at that time, um, uh, he, he told me to come up with a project to do together. So I went home and said, whoa, what, which project can I come up with uh, to do with Prince Charles? I mean, it's a big honor, it's a big thing. And then I connected the dots, sustainability, border free, students, young people. I then 
put the technology because like all the collection is powered by data and artificial intelligence and big data you know, to make it more modern and that's why modern artisan craftsmanship because i'm italian where craftsmanship is uh, like every day everywhere um and uh, so i i put everything together and that's the modern artisan project right well i think it sounds an absolutely uh, amazing project and i think you've not only connected dots you're moving you're moving the dots which is uh, which is super important so i've got to i'm going to go through some of the questions from the that have come in um on the q and a um and uh one of them is what does a typical day look like for you um um both before lockdown and now that we're in it. And again, quite take 15, 20 seconds to do short because there's a bunch of questions I'd love to get through for the audience. So do you have a typical day? I mean, clearly you're sitting in front of a screen talking um, uh, at the moment. Is that, was that typical, uh, was it nine weeks ago that we went into lockdown? What, what, did, what was a typical day before? before? So uh, during these nine weeks, uh, the easiest answer is uh, go and look on my Instagram. Uh, I think it's under smart working number seven. I've put the agenda, the typical agenda during these nine weeks, yeah. which has been, uh, as I said at the beginning, very intense. So yeah. my, my account on Instagram is Federico Marchetti and uh, there you can have uh, like, uh, you, uh, it's fun. It's, it's a fun agenda because it's, it's quite uh, intense and uh, it's quite disciplined. Uh, before, before uh, I was used to travel quite a lot um, because we have a joint venture in uh, China, we have a joint venture in uh, Dubai, uh, because we have shareholders in Switzerland, because uh, I commute between London and Milan, London and Milan, because we have basically two headquarters. One is the headquarter of Netaport and the other one is the headquarter of Ux. And yeah. even if um, the technology and the platform is one for the whole group, uh, we we decided um, at the time of the merger to keep separate the store and the DNA of each brand uh, because Netaporte, as I said, is very different from Ux. Yeah, brilliant. Um, uh, and a question um, which is, do you recommend spending some study time in a different country to anyone, you know, anyone and everyone? Is that something you'd recommend? Because you said it was very formative you yes. know, it changed your life. How did it, how so did it, how did it do that? This is a certainty. So this is not even a suggestion. So like uh, the more you travel, the more you get uh, exposed to different cultures, the more you learn about other people in different countries, the more you, you become friend with someone in Japan as well as someone in Canada, uh, the, the, the more you grow. And uh, there's no doubts about that. So I will uh, invite my young daughter to travel as much as possible and to spend time in different countries as a, I, I did uh, in a way uh, at Columbia University in New York. And then even Milan for me was, uh, let's say, coming from Ravenna was uh, very exotic in a way. Um, but yes, and, and also learn languages. Uh, not only spending time, but also learn languages, because I mean, uh, I wish that I, I, I could be bilingual like my daughter, uh, given that the mother is British, um, but I'm not, as you, as you could understand during this, uh, this, um, this speech. But I think that uh, speaking languages and knowing different cultures would give you such a boost in your life and your career that you cannot imagine. Brilliant. Um, a, a question here, which is, um, what knowledge, skills, and behaviors do young people need to become an entrepreneur? And, and I'm going to push you a little bit because you were lucky in that you knew from a young age that you were an entrepreneur and you described your career pathway as training to become an effective entrepreneur. Mm -hmm. So you did some steps because you knew you wanted to do that. What, what else? And you mentioned earlier data science and visualization and, and graphics is critical tools for you know enabling an e-commerce and fashion career at the moment but what else you know is there any you know what you know if you had advice for a 17 year old that wanted to do what you've done um what would you know are there skills or behaviors or knowledge that pop into your mind as the top ones to become an entrepreneur like you it's courage the the main quality is courage so like uh, with courage, you can overcome all the difficulties, all the problems, 
you can be always positive, uh, all, always optimistic also during the tough times, um, loving the change rather than being scared of the change. So I would say that uh, the, 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 the main quality that an entrepreneur should have is uh, courage. So look in, into yourself, look in your DNA, and if you have courage, if you are a knight, or if you are like uh, someone that um, uh, think different and love also to think different, I think uh, you are a natural born entrepreneur. Yeah. Can you, final question, can you learn to be an entrepreneur if you don't perceive yourself to have been born as one? I, I, I think so. I mean, definitely, I wouldn't think that only the sons or the daughters of the entrepreneurs can become entrepreneurs. So this is absolutely something that uh, I reject fully and 100%. So you can become an entrepreneur. Uh, you can learn to become an entrepreneur, a better entrepreneur, as, for example, I did myself. Uh, but you, have, you need to have inside uh, that sort of determination, courage, and uh, never give up um, that uh, is absolutely required for, from a character point of view. So I think uh, uh, you can learn to be an entrepreneur, but uh, uh, if you love, uh, let's say, um, easy, easy job, easy situation, and nine to five situations, uh, I think that then uh, it's better if you take another career. Yeah, um, brilliant. Well, uh, Federico, it's been an absolute joy to interview you. I loved hearing the story from a small village in Italy to uni in Milano to financial services in London and <laughs> MBA in New York, back to a, you know, sort of a, a rubbish job for a short time. Uh, and that starting off your entrepreneurial career, which has led you to incredible, incredible places and you know, fulfillment and impact for millions and millions of people. It's been a great, great to hear your story. Um, I found it inspiring. I hope that our audience has also found it inspiring. I and I, I, I look if forward if to- they understood, If they understood my English. <laughs> I, well, I think your I think your English is pretty good, uh, so uh, I'm sure I'm sure that they will. Um, so thank you for sharing your story. It's really important. Uh, I, I think it highlights the the joys of being an entrepreneur and uh, and also the pathways to it, and uh, and and where it might take you. So I, I look forward to our collaboration with you with Founders for Schools. And I hope that we can, um, actually, I'd love to touch base with the students at Dumfries uh, as well and hear how they're getting on. Uh, and uh, I, I look forward to purchasing something that they've co-designed with your, uh, your, your students in Milan. So um, I've, loved, uh, I've loved our time together. Thank you, thank you for that. Thank and you thank you also was, uh, for uh, our uh, partnership. It was great also for me. So like I enjoyed, uh, I enjoyed your questions. I, enjoyed, I, I, I congratulate for, for what you're doing and because you're doing great also what you're doing and uh, thank you everybody and think positive also during this time thank you yes thank you very much and we look forward to your colleagues also uh going visiting schools all around uh so that we can continue to spread uh, the word of entrepreneurship and enterprise and mission appreciate thank it you. thank you bye bye bye